Hi, I'm Genevieve. I'm polyamorous and non-monogamous for 12 years. I post long-form videos and resources here, short-form videos and resources here, and in this series, I look at non-monogamy in film and TV. What do they get right? What is messy and they get wrong? In my opinion, let's get into it. <music> 2001's Bandit shows how a polyamorous triad can form organically. Bandits is sort of a surreal love story heist movie where Terry and Joe are bank robbers and partners in crime who separately each fall in love with Kate. And people at the time hated it. In 2001, when this came out in the U.S. with two major U.S. action stars, Bruce Willis, Billy Bob Thornton, at the peaks of their career, two or three years prior, they had just been in Armageddon, which is this giant apocalyptic action movie, right? Very USA number one saves the day kind of movie. It's like, oh, the two of them are coming back together, except now there's no violence, there's no sex, there's very little suspense, and in fact, it's like a vehicle to discuss very sensitive, nuanced, romantic and sensual topics and non-monogamy <laughs> and it premiered in America one month after 9-11 like baby there was no hope <laughs> people were not in the headspace to be able to engage with this so I really want to some 23 years later give bandits its flowers I think the best way to explore the polyamory in bandits is by going through each of the relationships within the triad. Let's start with Terry and Joe, because that's what the movie starts with. Terry and Joe are partners in crime. Joe is the dreamer. He is impulsive. He has charisma and charm. And he's the reason that they broke out of prison. It was not this long planned prison break. He just saw an opportunity to hop in a cement roller. Terry was like, oh, I guess we're doing this now. And in a lot of ways, that is what their dynamic is. That Terry is a bit more anxious and shy. And so Joe helps propel him forward into risks that he would not take on his own. We don't even have a plan. You have to have some kind of plan to rob a bank. And Terry is more of a details guy. And so together they're able to execute more successful bank robberies because it's not all just impulse and reactivity. There's thoughtfulness, there's planning, and that is one of Terry's strengths. And the way they support each other forward can also be the ways that they challenge each other. Not unlike, you know, when we're drawn to someone because they're different, but then we're fighting with that person because they're different. You know what I mean? I'm trying to figure out why my partner here managed to spend two hundred thousand dollars very lovely young lady from the netherlands oh Dodge, color Sandy me Diego. surprised joe will just waste hundreds of thousands of dollars and terry's like you know every dollar that we spend is a dollar that we have to steal can you be a little bit more grounded and a little bit more thoughtful about this and similarly terry's concerns which can be an asset during periods of impulsivity if joe always listened to terry then they would never take any risk now, the media villainizes these bandits, calls them ruthless and dangerous, when in reality, they're pretty wholesome and cute. Like, these people befriend their hostages. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your cooperation. Just have a seat with everybody else. It's not going to take long. Monica? I have to go to the bathroom. Okay. No more juice boxes, Chloe. Okay? It is adorable. If anything, people kind of feel safe with these robbers. So this is not just a partnership of convenience or of necessity. They want to plan to stay working and living together. They imagine going down to Mexico and creating a new life together down there. Buy the hotel, turn it into a nightclub and resort. I could wear a tuxedo, sell margaritas to the tourists. You'd do that. I mean, you and me. Yeah. Partners. Partners. They are designing their happily ever after together. They long for a life of legitimacy and they long for that together. It's a really beautiful way to expand the definition of platonic partnership. It's something that I see everywhere in non-monogamy as we continue to question, you know, why does my romantic partner need to be the only one I build a life with? So Kate Blanchett is introduced with all this vibrant color and this lively music. This is the most alive the movie has ever been and that is not an accident. Now we're seeing some romantic comedy tropes because up to this, it had been like a buddy duo partners in crime adventure in a sense, right? Now we are getting to a woman in a domestic setting unappreciated by her husband. Kate, I have a dinner tonight, clients. Tonight? 
it's an interesting merging of these two genres in a lot of ways. And as she is singing, I Need a Hero, we keep cutting back and forth to Terry driving, right? They are about to have these two people meet and how that usually goes in a rom-com. Oh, I'm bumping into you. I didn't see you there. I dropped all of my papers, right? They turn the volume up a little bit on that here where she storms out of her home because she hates her life and she wants to die and then hits him with her car. And then she hits him with her car again. I think my actual notes were, meet cute, crash, she wants to die. So the way that Kate was introduced, I'm like, is she gonna be this Manic Pixie Dream Girl, right? If you're not familiar with the Manic Pixie Dream Partner trope, a very erratic and unpredictable, outgoing, vibrant, charismatic person, the function of them as a character is not to have their own internal world, it is to show up in the protagonist's life change that person's life, bring them out of their shell, or make them have a realization, and then the Manic Pixie Dream Partner fucks off. And I was really worried that's what they were gonna do with the entirety of the genius of acting that is Kate Blanchett. I was like, are you really gonna waste her? Luckily, I was pleasantly surprised. Terry is panicked, he doesn't know what to do, so he takes her back to their hideout. In an unlikely turn of their norm, he's the one to impulsively do something that then radically changes their trajectory. But the first duo, the first person to fall for Kate and vice versa, that is Joe. Their first interaction, he sees her in a way that her husband has not seen her in years. But I didn't take this so deeply at first because I'm like, well, Joe throughout the movie thus far has been a ladies man, right? But pretty immediately when she is saying that night that she's angry at her life, that she feels hopeless and has nothing left to look forward to, he inspires her. He gives her hope. He makes her feel alive again. And it's mutual. It's kind of corny. They're saying song lyrics to each other and he starts quoting some poetry that he admittedly doesn't really understand. And then they start making out and they like instantly fireworks. So what they don't do well together is like slowness or thoughtfulness or planning. You know what I mean? Like they aren't really that when they get together, it just off to the races with heat and passion and fire. And Terry's not a fan. And don't think I didn't see the look in your eye over there and the feet on her little hair and all that kind of stuff. I'm implementing a 24 hour rule from now on, okay? It's in effect. 24. 24 hours and not a minute longer, Missy. Like, do not threaten what he and I have planned together. You got to be gone after 24 hours. Like, I'm making an executive decision here, right? Ideally, what would happen here is they would talk about different ways to ease Terry's concerns. That's also a more vulnerable way to go about it, right? Is I'm not in charge of you. I obviously don't have the power to control who you are and what you're doing and what you're building together. And I'm scared. I try to go more the request for care rather than the exertion of control, I usually see that play out in a lot more amicable and collaborative and sustainable way. We're at kind of a crossroads here, and I want you to be very clear about my meaning. I'm changing the 24-hour rule, okay? I'm going to tell you this is not sustainable. The minute that Joe and Kate have this fiery, you know, sexual experience, then Joe says, I want to do away with the 24-hour rule, Right. So we don't want to ignore the valid reasons and fears and whatever that resulted in such a request. And we do want to push back on the request itself if that feels like it's not the right answer either. And you might think from here, how the hell do Terry and Kate fall in love? Is that completely out of left field? Yes and no. On one of these robberies, it goes a little south, the cops are on their tail, and they wind up just going off in different directions. To keep a low profile, Kate and Terry go to a motel for the evening, and we see them start to really, surprisingly, emotionally connect. This part does not necessarily come out of nowhere, because in the beginning when Joe saw Kate's beauty and her desirability, Terry also saw her emotional reality. I think you're bored. I think you're bored with your life and you're expecting that some miracle's gonna drop out of the sky and suddenly make everything better, or at least hopeful because you lost hope a long time ago. Before he ever has any desire for her, he challenges her and calls her out and sees her pretty clearly on an emotional level. And we see Kate in three versions of herself, a common device used in you know, visual storytelling. Someone is of multiple minds about something, or if someone has several versions of themselves in conflict at once, we see several versions of them on screen using mirrors. She is confronting who she's representing herself to be, who she thinks 
she is and who she actually is. And he sees who she actually is. So I think that initially set the tone for what Terry and Kate do as a dyad without Joe. They are sensitive and soft and cozy, right? She even tries to bring some of her intensity, like he's very nervous and he's shy and she's like, let me scare the sneezes out of you. <coughs> hey, hey, do, do you want me to <coughs> really scare you? That's not, no, that's for, uh, this is, that's for, oh, no, no, that's it works. Ah! No, don't, that's no. not. And he's like, I hated that. Please don't do that, right? When she's with Joe, he feeds her fire, right? It's fire and fire, and then they explode, right? Which is its own kind of beauty. But with Terry, it's almost like calming, creamy, soothing of the heat and fire that she is so prone to. Her softer side comes out, and then this very sweet, very gentle connection Forms. So I would suspect, you know, a non-insignificant amount of viewers watching this film would emasculate Terry in this situation, right? Would see the framing of two people wearing face masks, painting each other's nails pink as like they are girlfriends, right? Under the cishet framing of, you know, this is what women do together. This is a very like gentle soft man who his masculinity is not, uh, you know, harmed at all by wearing pink nails and that he is very emotionally open. And as far as the movie has told us, they are both cis and straight. They are breaking the rules of how a man and a woman on screen are supposed to fall for each other. And I love that. They do wind up sleeping together. And I think what's interesting is that the movie doesn't show a sex scene for either duo. These are the only two sexual relationships among the three people, and we don't see sex. We barely see kissing. The fact that they will touch on non-monogamy and explore these non-traditional configurations, the fact that sex is not an element of that is refreshing to me. The reunion is kind of interesting because Joe says, I missed you, and it's unclear who he's looking at or who he's talking to, which I'm sure was a deliberate choice. Yeah, yeah we, we missed, missed you, you too. too. Setting the tone for actually how they all feel about each other. And yet, because this is a kind of configuration that nobody has been in before, there is still that reliance on old social scripts that only one person should win. Let me keep her, okay? I'm not gonna do mine. that, I can't do that. Why, Joe? Are you boys sure you don't wanna kick my tires first? Unless you think that these are incredibly shallow solutions to a complicated problem that may require a little delicacy and understanding. So what do, you know, it becomes this choice of do I break my own heart in one respect so that I can preserve another part of my heart? Or can we imagine something different that actually we can do what we want to do, right? So in a moment, I'll get into how this trio does imagine something different. But first, I have to talk to you about how the film uses color because it is not subtle, I'll tell you what. Like they even have establishing shots of this word color on the side of a building. The word color is front and center several times. And I was wondering, I was like, why are they being so heavy handed? I think it's because they changed so many expectations in this movie. They're not doing a heist movie the way you're supposed to. They're not doing a romance movie the way you're supposed to. All the dialogue is strange. All the people act weird. And so so if they use really exaggerated or surreal color schemes, that doesn't really register as being all that strange in the universe of the film because a lot of things are strange. There are four main colors that come up over and over again, red, green, blue, and pink. Red, green, and blue are primary colors. They are the basis for most of our contemporary color theory. Pink is a little bit of a wild card and that's not by accident. So red, usually you'll see films use red as danger or passion and intensity. But that's not how this movie uses it, true to form. In fact, I think there's a good case to say that Bandits uses red to signify false danger that is actually a safe situation. The first car that they steal is red, if you don't count the cement truck, right, that they use to escape the prison. And they stop a woman who smiles and is charmed by Joe and just happily gets out of the car and gives it to him. It is not violent, it is not antagonistic, in fact, it seems like a nice experience for her, even though they drive away in her car. One of their first hostages is a redhead named Cherry, who's like pretty chill about it, doesn't call the cops, and even helps them escape. 
some of their next hostages is an entire family that they're eating dinner with. It kind of gives off an awkward vibe of two people that you don't know that well, but not of like two dangerous, violent people holding you hostage. And one of the kids, who is actually Bruce Willis's real kid, by the way, both of these kids are, one of the kids says the sauce is too red. The sauce is too red. It's not too red. Yes, it is. The sauce is too red. What a weird, what does that mean? Like there's no reason to have that line of dialogue, to call attention to the color in the text text unless you're trying to make us connect some dots here. And of course, Kate is a vibrant redhead. You know, she seems dangerous to their dynamic, and yet at the end of the day, helps them do a better job at robbing banks and brings them ultimately closer together. And in fact, it's notable, there's only two times in this film that Kate is wearing a wig that she is covering up her red hair, and there are two times of actual danger. One is on a robbery that winds up going wrong. You know, they almost get caught. And the second time she wears a brunette wig is when she separates from the two of them. She thinks she has to break it off. That's when they say, we want you back, we miss you. The next time we see her with them, she's a redhead again. But no conversation about Kate would be complete without talking about the color blue. And at first I thought this was Kate's color, right? She's introduced with it, she's wearing blue. When she and Joe take off to the beach, it is a very blue beach. But upon rewatch, I saw, you know, there are plenty of scenes where Kate is nowhere to be found and there is still this blue. It only ever comes up when there is passion, when there is heat, which is also using the color differently than other films use it. Blue is often a calming, soothing color, right? But no, here they're saying there is fiery passion, they're falling in love, or intense anger, it's a fist fight. Some of the only violence that we see in the movie is under this blue light. And now I'm locked in. Now I'm like, what do these other two colors mean? So if blue is passion and emotion, we tend to see green contrasting that as rationality or logic all over the frame when they are robbing a bank, when they are going according to plan. We see green dominating the frame in their hideout spot, right? When they are safe and hidden from the cops. And then Kate, with her prominent blue and red, enters to interrupt that color. And towards the end, when Terry and Joe are having a conflict about both loving Kate, we see blue and green fighting in the frame or cutting back and forth between just blue and just green, logic and emotion. And notably, Kate interrupts this as well, descending down cloaked in green to give an appeal to reason. So it's the primary colors, but what the hell does pink have to do with anything, right? Like, why throw in a curveball that doesn't fit with the others unless they wanted pink to represent the unexpected? Pink pops up when things don't go according to plan. It's even, arguably, the reason that things don't go according to plan. On the robbery where they almost get caught, the reason is because their getaway driver, Harvey, gets distracted by a woman wearing pink boots. Pink. The girl? Pink boots. And similar to the pasta sauce comment, the only reason that that dialogue would exist is for the viewer to take note of the color. Then we see pink all over the hotel that Terry and Kate go to when they fall in love. Another curveball, another unexpected plot twist. I've never seen so much pink in my goddamn life. So there are plenty of films where the creators are not very intentional, right? Where they do things that actually it is a coincidence. But every time I see something like this, which is such a specific choice, and they go hard, why did they choose it? What is the frame trying to tell us about thematic elements or emotional tone, you know? So I think it can be very fun and nerdy and sometimes more of a satisfying viewing experience to really think critically when we notice that sort of thing. Okay, that's enough film nerd stuff. Let's explore this three-person relationship. What if I don't want to? Don't want to what? Choose. Wait. You know, I don't, I don't think I can. And, and you know, if, that, if that's scary or, or against the laws of, you know, man or whatever, then... I mean, you're outlaws, right? I guess I'm an outlaw, too. Why can't we, all three of us together, find some sort of situation that works, you know? Why does there have to be some possessiveness or competition in our connection? We're doing everything else different than we're supposed to. Why not do this differently, too? What they don't do together, as far as we know, is sex or romance, right? Because the two men and their partnership don't have that, so the triad doesn't really have that either. And the movie reinforces here that each connection is its own thing, because when Kate is alone with either of the men, 
And she's a very different Kate. And so what Kate and Joe have is very passionate and intense. What Kate and Terry have is very sweet and nurturing. And what Terry and Joe have is a combination of those two things, albeit not in a romantic way. Now, the big conflict between them is one of like, what is this and what are we doing, right? She's really saddened that their dynamic seems to be at odds to the point that she wants to remove herself. I won't let you do this to each other. I just, I... I can't. And yes, I'm aware that this is entirely my own fault. It's just that I, I can't choose between you. This is over. She would rather end her two relationships with them than have this friendship fall apart. It's just very common that in a triad, if two people were in a relationship first, there can be this sort of like last one in, first one out mentality as a default. And so anytime we're just assuming, oh, well, I must matter less because I'm newer, or, you know, we would not be having this fight if it weren't for this newer person, when in reality, most of the time, the fight comes from some pre existing conditions that this dynamic is shining a spotlight on you know what I mean so can there just be some thoughtfulness and some slowness in final decision making around breakups like that that can minimize regret in a lot of ways and in this case all three of them regret it it was a knee-jerk response that she thought would heal and in fact nobody liked it what I'm trying to say is we both miss you equally equally we both miss you equally we take full responsibility full. it's Really? The two men come back together, right? Reaffirm their friendship and realize we miss you, Kate. And just in case we weren't sure that all three are committed to being a trio now, we see Kate's estranged, sort of comically awful husband on screen. Kate, if you're listening, I, I want you to know that uh, the house is waiting for you right here where, where, where you belong. You belong at home. The house is waiting for you. Not even I'm waiting for you. And the house misses you. I miss you. Uh... I miss him. He has no idea where I belong. You belong here. Yeah, with us. They say you belong with us. There is a peace, there is an acceptance to the fact that we both love you and we both want you to be here with us while we continue doing what we're doing too. She was so unhappy doing what you're supposed to do to get married, to get a house, that she was following the role that was pre-written for her and was miserable and wanted to die in that. But now she's in this triad that is so confusing and new and somewhat volatile for that reason. And also there's so much love and warmth there. There is collaboration and teamwork and no prescriptive roles that anybody has to play. And in the triad is when we see the biggest contrast between the outside perspective and the reality. People think she's a victim and a hostage and she's in danger from these two very violent men, right? And like that clearly ain't the case, right? But what's also cool is they use that misconception to their advantage. She ultimately decides to turn them in and get the one million dollar reward and then joe and terry fake their own death in a fake shootout so the cops are no longer looking for them with this extra million dollars funding their lifestyle they get to go down to mexico and have their happily ever after together this film is not for everyone, right? Like I said, it's an odd one. It can be a challenging, even confusing viewing experience because it is so different in so many ways. And it's also an overtly polyamorous story with a happy ending. It is the formation of a triad without agenda or unicorn hunting. It just sort of happens and they negotiate it as they go. So whether you're polyamorous or not, you know, I'd be interested to know your thoughts on this film, especially though if you're in a non-monogamous triad, I'd be curious if you see yourself on screen. Thanks so much for being here and I'll see you next time. Thank you.